Okay, Tracy. What's uh... hello, everybody? I'm not sure anybody can see us yet. That the numbers climbing, participant numbers climbing. Yeah, it's climbing. It's going from around the world, ladies and gentlemen. Although not as much around the world, starting at five o'clock West Coast time. It's only the people who are committed. It's true. It's Except true. For alarms to wake up. What time is it there now? Midnight? No. Ah, uh, in Burgundy, it is one in the morning. Yeah, oh, there's probably people up. Yeah, the chat room is up and humming, ladies and gentlemen, already. Um, Love it. I wonder if uh, Jonathan is on. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, we're going to try to get the screen. You guys can see us. Let's see. Let's see. Somebody's chatting at us. Okay. All right. I can't personally uh, tell whether or not the screen has the slide up or has you and I up, Tracy. But you know what? This is technology. So let's. Uh, there we go. Okay. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, Good evening or good afternoon, wherever you might happen to be. Uh, those of you who don't know, our uh, Jean Nicola has gotten much better looking over the past nine days. And we have not only that, but someone who is uh, uh, our associate winemaker is joining us in, in an essential part of the trio, Tracy Kendall. Welcome, Tracy. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm excited to be here to talk about own rooted vines. We were uh, mentioning earlier that uh, it's, it's a different time. So our, uh, on the last session, we had folks from Dubai, we had people from London, we had people from Germany, Brussels, uh, a pretty solid contingent of folks from France. Uh, and tonight, I don't reckon we're gonna have a whole lot of those people. It, it would be uh, one o'clock in France and midnight, in, in, or no, actually one in, in London and two o'clock in, in France right now in Dubai. I haven't traveled there enough to actually even know what time it would be there, but it's probably three or four in the morning, something like that. But uh, today, uh, or this evening, we're gonna be tasting uh, some wines and talking about phylloxera. Not exactly an exciting subject for those who own vineyards, but uh, something that's very interesting and has a really unique history. Um, we, uh, of course, wanna make this fun, so we won't, we're not gonna actually start drinking right this second, but those of you that have the bottles, we don't want you to hesitate whatsoever. Those of you on the East Coast where it's eight o'clock might be eating at the same time or some cheese or whatever it is that you're doing, please feel free and, and, and jump in there. Um, we do have the Q&A uh, set up, so we'll be looking at that periodically and, and certainly wanna make this as interactive as we can. Um, and uh, more than anything, we wanna have fun. This is the second one, as you know, we announced a couple others, and we've got some really interesting ideas coming down the pike. Some, some fun chefs that have reached out uh, that are interested in uh, participating, some sommeliers, and we're just gonna try to make this new world that we're living in as interesting and exciting as possible. So um, without any further ado, uh, Tracy, do you wanna start us out on the, the history of uh, the evil louse that <laughs> is phylloxera? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I think this is such an interesting topic because really own rooted vines aren't very prevalent in the world anymore. We're going to talk about why. Um, but almost all the wines that you drink on a daily basis or a weekly basis or whenever you partake um, are affected by the fact that phylloxera kind of wiped out all of those own rooted vines in the world, right? And phylloxera is a pest. It's essentially an insect. Um, it's sort of a louse aphid hybrid, and it eats and lives on grapevines. Unfortunately, the vinifera vines that we've all known to come and, and love and enjoy drinking. It's about the size of a noceum. So you all know the joke, I know see them. Um, it's tiny, right? It's not the kind of thing that you can dig in the ground and see walking around. It's not the size of a flea. It's much smaller than that. If you think an inch, it's about 0 0.04 inches by 0 0.02 inches. So really quite tiny. Um, and they can eat through 
New root growth, which is where you can sometimes see them seasonally. If you did, you can see some swelling or some yellowing of those roots, but they also eat through existing established root systems, which is what's so devastating. Um, and you often then get a necrotic or sort of secondary fungal um, infection. So the necrosis sets in and that root slowly starts to die. Um, it'll create what they call a girdling, right? And kind of cut off that upper layer of the root. Um, and that stops the flow of the carbohydrates to the vine. So what you start to see, and you can really see it in this slide on the bottom right of the screen, is what they call a lens. So it starts in a circle and it, the louse spreads out as it grows and keeps eating vines in a circular fashion. Um, and above ground, what you're seeing is shoot growth um, is diminished and decreasing, and then subsequently fruit set is decreasing. So you really lose productivity. It can be quite quick, it can be slow, um, but often within three to 10 years of this starting to take over, you're really seeing decreased production. Um, and it's devastating. And it, as you can see from this slide, you know, most vineyards are planted because they're in rows for all kinds of reasons. You have a block sort of situation. And because this happens in a circular way, you can't just replant small sections that are affected by blocks, right? You really have to take out most of that block as it starts to spread and you start to lose productivity to the point where you're not getting fruit that you either like anymore or that's economically viable and you have to replant that block. Um, it's it's uh, one of the scariest things to see. There's very little you can do to prevent it. You certainly see it more in years where you have any kind of stress to the vines. Um, a lot of nutrient uptake is uh, water uptake. And so whenever you have a year that's a lot of drought or dry, it's um, very difficult for vines that are under phlox or stress because that root system is already so weak that you're not getting those uptake nutrients, you're not getting the higher carbohydrates to really push growth in the vine. So essentially it's a bug that's eating the roots and it's causing the vine to slowly die. More or less than you wanted to know. <laughs> Feel free to ask questions. Exactly. And if you uh, own a vineyard that's on its own roots, as we do, then you definitely do not want to see this little louse. Uh, we have uh, a guest appearance by uh, our partner, uh, Mr. Mayo, uh, and he actually filmed this little video for you talking about uh, phylloxera and the history of it as it relates to France and Burgundy. So take a look. Phylloxera was a major blow to French and European viticulture. It started uh, in the mid 1860s in the south of France, spreading into the southwest, Languedoc, Provence, made its way up north in the Rhone Valley and reached finally uh, Burgundy in uh, the, 18, uh, the late 1870s and eventually the whole of Europe. So in a way it was progressive but uh, it destroyed everything and it was also inexorable. During that time, of course, after a first movement of, of, of panic, um, governments uh, appointed scientists to find solutions. And basically, two major solutions appeared. One was chemical, fighting the bug with a chemical. And the other one was botanical. The reasoning between, behind it being that phylloxera and native vineyards in America had coexisted for some time, and naturally, native American vineyards had developed a, uh, a resistance to the bug. So why not use that resistance uh, to fight it and to uh, recreate uh, European vineyards? The first uh, method, the chemical method, was in a way traditional. When you have an invasive bug, the first reaction is to try to kill it. Uh, so a, a chemical was found, carbon sulfur, and was used for a very long time. Um, it, it proved to be uh, tedious. Uh, you had to uh, put it into a kind of big syringe and inject it vine by vine at the foot of the vine because, of course, the, the, the damage the, caused by phylloxera was behind uh, in the ground and you had to kill the larvae in, in the ground. So extremely tedious, 
dangerous also because the chemical was not uh, very healthy, although that was not really a major concern at the time, and, uh, uh, and not extremely effective at the same time because, of course, the sheer volume to treat was, was, was absolutely enormous and you could perhaps control the bug, but certainly not uh, eliminate it. The other uh, solution was uh, more innovative, uh, using American vineyards to save uh, the European vineyards. Um, and first, uh, hybrids were thought of, you know, uh, kind of crossing American vines with European vines. But of course, the major problem was quality. What uh, uh, it was a, a big change of uh, character in the in, in, in the wine, and it could be a solution for cheap wines. And indeed, uh, hybrids produced uh, wine was produced from hybrids for a long time in France. But of course, it was not a solution for the Grand Cru, which were beginning to emerge and being classified at that period. And uh, many owners worried about uh, the, the vanishing uh, of uh, their uh, prized vineyards and wines. So uh, it, um, uh, it took some time to, to find the solution, especially since um, uh, American uh, vines were not necessarily adapted to, uh, to Europe. Uh, there was the problem of limestone and finding uh, vineyards, uh, plants uh, coming from America that would be uh, resistant to uh, limestone, which is quite prevalent in, uh, in Burgundy and elsewhere in, uh, in Europe. So there were many trials and errors. And at some point, the uh, French gov government appointed a, a scientist uh, to um, execute a mission to America to find some of uh, the American uh, vineyards uh, that would be best suited uh, for that purpose. <laughs> so it was uh, obviously a huge deal in France. And uh, at one point, I know that this was, uh, jean Nicolas was talking about how it was a major issue for the French government. And you can imagine, especially at that time, the impact this had on the French economy. And I've been told both jean Nicolas wasn't 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure that uh, unrooted vines are now outlawed in France. I mean, you're not allowed to consciously plant them. Um, and that's a government rule. Uh, I guess going back to just sort of in indic indicative of how big the impact was on the French economy of having these vineyards be wiped out. Um, the, the thing that's sort of interesting about after they so came up with the solution and had the rootstock that was uh, resistant and, and, and you know, pretty much is consistently resistant, it has in fact fixed the problem. There, there is no more issue of phylloxera uh, taking down vines and vineyards that were planted on these phylloxera resistant rootstocks. So it is actually solved problem. And then you sort of get to the point of, well, wait a minute, uh, you guys are releasing an own rooted cuvee. You obviously have own rooted vines in Oregon. What is up with that? Were they planted before 1900? Was this, I mean, was this a long time ago that they just didn't know? And um, it's a really good question. It's a really good question. Why would you plant own rooted vines in a Oregon and knowing full well that phylloxera could potentially uh, take them down. Well, the answer is um, a lot of people did it. It was not just one or two. And uh, the reasons that they gave, or at least they have given in terms of folks that we've talked to and what we've read, is that they simply didn't think that it was going to come to Oregon. I mean, it sounds a little naive looking back at it. And David Adelsheim had a really funny quote for me about the fact that we, you know, we were just farmers and we were you know, not really paying, we weren't botanists. This is not what we were doing. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that phylloxera is there um, and did come there. Um, and even though some of the first vines that were planted, some of the first vineyards in, in, in 76, the Highland Vineyard, one of the vineyards we're gonna talk about, is, um, I guess I did not turn off that text. Um, one of the first vineyards we're gonna talk about was planted in 1976 and it still thrives today, but most of the vineyards uh, in Oregon that were planted on, on their own roots are gone. 
And there's a gentleman who's actually on the, on the uh, webinar today, Tom Miller, who I was emailing back and forth, and he had compiled this list that I went through earlier today. Um, I knew most of these vineyards, uh, but there are so many vineyards here that have now uh, were planted and were th successful on, on their own roots and now are gone. I mean, Knight's Gambit was a vineyard that we were working with that got pulled out. The Irie vineyards lost, uh, lost a bunch. Um, uh, Christum, I know, lost some. Uh, the uh, Bethel Heights has, has had to pull some out. Um, there's just, there's a ton of vineyards that are coming out literally or almost literally every year. Um, so it, it is a situation where uh, this is something that is fleeting and is going away. But we are fortunate in the sense that we have three uh, vineyards that we source fruit from, one of which we own. What's happening here? Hold on. Did we? One of which we, uh, we're having some technical problems here. One of which that we, uh, we have three vineyards of which are on their own roots. Uh, the first we're going to talk about is Bishop Creek, which I'm very pleased to say does not have phylloxera. Um, Bishop Creek, we talked a little bit on our last webinar. It's our, it's our home vineyard. It's the vineyard that we own. It was planted in 1987 and 88. We're looking at block one. Um, and these vines do not have phylloxera. Uh, we had it tested before we bought it in 2014, and then about two years later, we, Tracy, jean Nicola, and I started to see some cells going where there's some sections, and we thought, oh boy, here we go. And um, in fact, we, we, we thought for sure that this is, this is what is going to happen, and now we have to go into maintenance and trying to, to, tr to treat the vineyard uh, uh, in terms of farming to try to get it to last as long as we possibly could. But the, the reality was is that it, it, it does not have phylloxera. The test came back negative, and we're very fortunate to have that. Did I lose Tracy somehow in this? Um, I'm not sure what's going on here. But um, one thing we should make sure you're doing, I see on somebody some of the chat things that people are drinking, but this is the bottle that we're starting out with here. This is the, the own rooted 2017. Um, this is a new release for us. We've never done this blend before. Um, it is a, a mixture of the Bishop Creek that we talked about, the Highland Vineyard, and the Nisa Vineyard, all three uh, vineyards that all make up uh, a good chunk of our Willamette Valley that you guys enjoy and that we drank uh, last time. Um, those three make up more than 50% of, of the Willamette Valley, as a matter of fact. Um, but this is the first time we've ever done this, and uh, Tracy, you're back. Did I lose you for a minute? Can we hear you? Sick. Can you notice I was gone? I did notice. I was panicking, and I actually was kind of like wondering what the <laughs> hell was happening and trying to be the newscaster that kept going, but... Uh, yeah, not that well. Clearly not a professional. But at any rate, I was talking about the, uh, the blend of the three vineyards. And uh, we had this idea and put this wine together and how you might want to talk about because we tasted them all individually, but you're never quite sure what's going to happen when you blend it together. And this was a case where we were actually more than thrilled with the result. Yeah, I mean, blending is fascinating because it's not like you take a little bit of salt, a little bit of sugar and a little bit of acid and somehow it just coalesces. Sometimes when you put two wines together, things get magnified that you didn't even realize were in the wine, right? And all of a sudden, things you thought, this is going to be great tannin with really nice overlay of fruit, they're going to be beautiful together. All of a sudden, it becomes a tannin bomb, right? Or a fruit bomb or something that doesn't work. And these three vineyards, Nisa Highland and um, Bishop Creek that we're going to talk about are really different, right? Bishop Creek is quite masculine, a lot of strong tannin, a lot of minerality. Highland is really pretty, quite ethereal and light with that koi clone. And Nisa is really red fruited and really silky. And so it's, it's very easy to conceptually think that they would not play well together. And as much as we wanted to make this wine, because we thought it would be fascinating to be able to show you, right, what own vines are, I think we were all a little bit nervous that maybe it wouldn't come together. Um, and we would never, it's never our intention to put something out because we like the concept, right? For us, it has to be the very best wine we can present. And so, 
I think we were very pleasantly surprised at not only how well they blended together, but the fact that this became, I think, one of our favorite wines, really, from day one. The beauty of the way these three vineyards just sing together is stunning. Really fun. Yeah, and as we, we all tasted last week, we were tasting the 17s. The 17s vintage is extremely approachable. It's very fresh. It has um, a, a, a real kind of... Um, softness and, and, and so it got this approachability, a great mouthfeel um, earlier as we talked about before than the previous vintages, certainly 15 and 16. Maybe 14 was similar to that, but 15 and 16 definitely were, you know, not as, as, as quick to be approachable. Um, and I think having these three vineyards together alone, or, you know, these three versus being part of eight, it's really been fascinating to, uh, to, to be out there and, and, and taste with people. We just released this wine uh, literally a couple weeks ago when I was, um, on, in Chicago, we went to, Kevin and I, our, our new sales director, went to Chicago and Boston and New York and DC. It was one of the first times that I had the opportunity to actually taste this wine with restaurants and, uh, and, and Psalms and with uh, retail shops. And the reaction was incredible. Really great. I think there's also this mysticism and this kind of magical concept of own rooted and the kind of uh, forbidden, you can't have it and so on and so forth. But really the flavors and, and, and the, um, the complexity of the wine, I think, really came through in a way. And, and the reaction was incredible. Really, really nice. Yeah, that's right. So this, uh, this screen is Bishop Creek. Yeah. <laughs> and this is Nisa. Um, we made about 200 cases of the, 220, I think, or something like that, of, of the own rooted. Uh, I think most of you have this wine. That's, that's your part of this, part of this tasting. Um, if you guys have any comments, I have a couple of questions, actually questions more about um, the phylloxera that we could ask is, um, is this something that you would notice right away or not notice until the five or 10 year mark in terms of phylloxera? It's really something you notice quickly, right? Yeah. I mean, supposedly we always have this fear and we talk about, you know, Bishop Creek has no phylloxera at this point, knock on wood, right? But we'll see a vine that looks weak or an area that looks a little bit weaker and be concerned about it. So you definitely start to see um, stunted shoot growth pretty quickly. The question is how long has the louse been there by the time you see that stunted shoot growth? It depends so much on some of the factors we're going to talk about as we run through these different vineyards, but soil type, you know, what kind of years you've had. If you've had two really wonderful, lots of great moisture years, the rains have been really normal, you haven't had a bunch of heat spikes, um, not a hugely high fruit set, you may not notice in those two years. And then the third year, when you have a little bit of a drought, all of a sudden your lens is huge, right? It's massive. Um, and, yeah. you know, Tracy, it was interesting. Um, you mentioned because 17, this is the first year that we made the own rooted, but that was the year that you and I were really scared that, that, that NISA was, was going down. I mean, that was a really low yield in 17. And we were kind of thinking like, oh boy, I don't, I don't know about this particular, uh, this section of the vineyard and how, how long it was going to last. And then the next year, it kind of bounced back. What well, was 16 that was so bad in Nisa, where we had 0.8 tons per acre? Oh, I thought it was 17. It was a low yield year because we had a huge heat spike during flowering, right, which is the time when you get that fruit set. And so all the yields were down. And then we had a lot of drought that summer, which we'd had in 14 and 15. And so in 16, I mean, literally 0.8 tons per acre when we want to average two and a half to three for fruit quality is almost nothing, right? You're getting one or two tiny clusters of tiny berries on those vines which makes for stunning concentration and a lot of intensity in the wine, but really scary to see. And then 17 this year, which I think is why it's a little bit softer and a little bit more ethereal and the tannins are a little bit more dissolved. Yeah. Yeah. And see, also some of the, some of the, um, in those low years, uh, the other issue that can happen with phylloxera based on at least what we've been told is that you get some, some odd flavors as well. When, when the vineyard is really starting, you're starting to lose it. And that's why eventually people end up pulling it out because it's that concentration, but it actually goes over to the other side where it's not really enjoyable concentration. 
Yeah, you start to feel that stress, right? Which is kind of like dried fruit, tequila, agave. It's the same thing you get from a drought stress sort of situation. It's just exacerbating that drought stress because the vine's really not taking up much moisture at all. And there's a comment in the panel, can you do anything to prevent phylloxera? You're really just avoiding, yeah, you're just buying time, right? A lot of people do organic or biodynamic farming because what you're looking for is vine health. So anything like, dynamics certainly do that, right? Can help to prolong the life of the vine, um, can help to really stabilize the vine, but you're really buying time. There's no way to reverse phylloxera. We lost you there for a second with the internet. What you were talking about things you can do to uh, extend the life of the vineyard? Yeah, really organic and biodynamic farming are the things yeah. that we'll focus on, right? Getting compost to the vine, anything that's going to help the vine um, in, in normal times, right? Anything that's going to create promote growth and, and health of the vine is going to help for phylloxera too. Because that root system is struggling. Think of it as it's a straw that's too narrow, right? Or it's kinked. And so it's struggling to take up carbohydrates. It's struggling to take up water. So anything you can do to give it more carbohydrates, more nutrients, more water is going to help prolong the life of the vine. But you're never going to be able to reverse the effect of phylloxera. Once it's there, it's there. And if you have owner vines, they're coming out eventually, maybe later than you thought but they're coming out so um in in the nisa vineyard we did actually take some some vines out the owner we as you guys know don't own nisa we farm that with uh, a gentleman named michael mega and uh, this year he pulled out a good section of part of the it, not a good section but a, a few rows of the block that we had um, we are going to get some more different vines, so don't worry. We will still have some Nisa coming our way. But that vineyard has phylloxera and is really, um, you know, in that spiral. And I don't know how long it's going to be before all the old vines come out, hopefully uh, in another few years. But um, there's no doubt that, that, we're gonna, that once that vineyard starts that cycle, it goes down. And thank God Bishop Creek, Bishop Creek either doesn't have it or there have been lots of theories about the amount of water and how it retains water in the winter. And, and, and in France, that was actually one of the things that they did to try to kill off the louse was they would flood the vineyards at the turn of the century. That was one of the strategies that they had. So there's some possibility that that's going on at Bishop Creek and that's why we don't have it. Um, there's also the possibility that it's just isolated and so forth. Um, one of the questions that's coming up was the Willamette Valley being a majority of own rooted plants. Are there some similarities between the Willamette Valley and the own rooted? Uh, or you're actually saying that there are. This is Eric um, saying, but I would say that the own rooted has an intensity and a snap uh, above the, the, the Willamette Valley. It's stunning. Well, thank you, Eric. Um, I, I would say that they're, they're different. I mean, they're certainly different. I think having uh, vineyards like Temperance Hill, having vineyards like uh, Mimi Castile's Hopewell, um, bringing that elegance, the Knight's Gambit vineyard, uh, I think they all bring different things to it, uh, the Willamette Valley that the Own Rooted doesn't have, but there's no doubt that these, these three wines really go, these three different vineyards go very, very well together. Um, the third yeah. vineyard that we are going to talk about is uh, the, the Highland Vineyard. And uh, the Highland, you see a map up there showing these three different vineyards and the soils for each. Um, the Highland is the oldest of the vineyard, uh, of the three vineyards uh, planted in, in 76. And um, the, it's also interesting, the Highland is plant is farmed biodynamically, uh, where Nisa and Bishop Creek are, are farmed organically. But all three of them, uh, there's no chemicals or anything used in, in any of the three vineyards. I think, too, going back to what you were saying before, Jay, one of the things that's really important to know about phylloxera, maybe the most important thing, is that it's very soil driven. So if you look at this slide, which is a great way to look at it, um, Jory soil, where Nisa Vineyard is, which is the only of these three vineyards that's struggling with a lot of phylloxera, is a perfect home for the phylloxera laos. They love clay, thick clay soils, which is what Jory is, right? It's that like kind of viscous, you push it together, it's super high water holding capacity and the Laos just thrives in it. Whereas the marine sedimentary, right, the Bishop Creek, which is on those ancient marine kind of sandy soils, silty soils, same with Highland, which is sort of a hybrid, the Laos doesn't do as well there. So you don't see as much penetration in vineyards that are on that soil type. 
And there's places in the world that because they're on sandy soils, Washington being one of them, that's now starting to see a little bit of phylloxera with climate change, very much less phylloxera and less um, rapid movement. People are also yeah, as well, right? Chile is another place where there's some unrooted vines that have survived due to the sandy soils. And flood irrigation. Chile is an interesting hybrid of the two because we talk about Bishop Creek having super wet feet in the winter, that whole water idea. Then in the winter, it literally is drowning in a flood irrigation situation that's natural, right? It's rain. We don't irrigate at any of our vineyards, but rain, rain falls from the sky, very thickly set on the ground, and so that can actually drown the Laos. And Chile's been doing that for a long time, and so that may be a big part of why we don't see it there. It's also surrounded by pine forest, and there's a lot of new theory coming out that pine resin is a repellent for phylloxera in general. And so vineyards that are more isolated, which Yamho Carlton being a super big AVA, same with McMinnville, a lot of isolated vineyards. Nobody's, you can't see any vineyards when you're standing at Bishop Creek. The Dundee Hills is, you know, the New York City, right, of uh, planting. And so everywhere you are, there's a vineyard right there, and there's a vineyard right there, and there's a fence, and there's another vineyard. And it makes it very easy for the Laos to sort of travel. And there's no pine trees breaking that up. It's interesting. Um, when you guys come out and visit Bishop Creek, you'll see that uh, the vast, well, certainly two sides, two and a half sides of the entire vineyard are covered by dense, thick pine forest. Um, you know, it's very, very present and, and re you really feel isolated when you're at Bishop Creek. It's beautiful and urge you guys to come out and visit us. Um, a couple of questions coming in that I wanted to read. Um, there's a question about uh, whether or not the U.S. might make planting unrooted unru vines illegal, uh, similar to what uh, some folks have said has happened in France. I don't know anything about th that being discussed. I think that you'd be hard pressed to get somebody who would plant it. I don't know why people would. Um, I guess, you know, you could say, well, they did it in the 70s and 80s in, in Oregon. Might they do it again? Um, I, I don't know, Tracy, have you heard of anybody planting own rooted? Yeah, I don't want to lambast anyone by name, but yes, people planted own rooted vineyard four years ago. I mean, I think it's somewhat hubris, right? And Obviously, we think that there's something special about unrooted vines, which is why we have made this blend for you. And I think we're going to talk about that and touch on that. But, you know, people want that connection straight from the earth, from the soil and the root system up into the vine. And you, you get that, right? That's the only time, the only way that you can really get that unbroken connection. So if you plant unrooted vines, you may know that in 10 years, you're going to have to replant them. That's a huge economic hit. So again, I say hubris because I think you have to be willing to take that chance and think that somehow either it's going to escape you or it's worth it, but you don't hear about it much. Certainly. Yeah, no, I think the idea of worth it is um, interesting because I think what part of makes, what makes these vines so interesting, these wines so interesting and these vineyards so interesting is their age. And I think the chances of having um, a, a vineyard like Highland that is, uh, you know, 44 years old or Bishop Creek, which is over 30 years old or Nisa, which is nearly just about 30 years old now and, and planting a vineyard today and thinking you're going to get that kind of life uh, out of own rooted is, is, is a, a big gamble to say the least, uh, you know, very, very. For sure. Gamble. Well, that's one of the things that, that's one of the debates, right? Is own rooted better, right? That sort of better statement, or is it really that those are older vines that people have kept in the ground because they're really fantastic, right? If you have older vines in the ground that you don't like, you would have either top grafted them, you would have pulled them out and replanted them. So the fact that they've stayed in the ground, people are still making wine from them is a huge factor and maybe the bigger factor than their own rooted, right? And you never get to have that side by side. It's, it's so hard to say. Yeah, it's impossible. It, like people will say, well, you know, if it, <laughs> Is it better? It's like you say, you can, well, you can't really do side by side. You would have to plant them on the same site 40 years ago and, and, and sort of do the AB. I like doing these virtual tastings at five o'clock Pacific time, much better than at noon. Just something about, I mean, day drinking is great. I mean, God knows there's a lot of day drinking going on during this pandemic, but, uh, but it is nicer to do it at five o'clock. Much, much nicer. And plus we'll have this to be able to drink with dinner or immediately afterwards. It's Fantastic. Um, a couple of more questions coming in. Um, the clonal composition for each of these vineyards. Uh, the Bishop Creek, uh, I'll talk about Bishop Creek, is a uh, Pomard clone, is the, uh, the own rooted, and Vadensville is, is, the, is the own rooted. 
And then there's this peculiar um, Sauvignon Blanc uh, uh, root. Well, actually, it's not really, it's Sauvignon Blanc rootstock. It's grafted, right? It's not really technically own rooted. Not the way that we're talking about it and valuing yeah. it. Right? Yeah, exactly. So Pomard and Vadensville. Highland is the Cory clone. Is that right, Tracy? Um, yeah. And Nisa is Pomard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for us. Um, it doesn't, going to Randall's question, I don't see any, he's asking if there are certain clones that are more resistant to Phloxera. I don't know that anyone has studied that. I don't, I wouldn't think so. And you know, there's so little research now about what a clone's actual rootstock is, right? When we talk about rootstocks and the research around rootstocks, it's all about the rootstocks that we use to graft because those are choices we get to make. We can say, okay, we want to put Pomard on this rootstock because it's less vigorous, or we want to put it on this rootstock because it's going to be more drought tolerant. But we don't ever talk about what the real rootstock is for Pomard and what the characteristics are. We just talk about it as Pomard. So I would say I don't know. I would think not. It's all vinifera. It's all the same plant. Um, maybe clones that set more lightly would put less stress on the root system and therefore might survive longer. With but again, it's a very tough thing to, yeah. to, you can't exactly research it. You can't do any case, you know, any sort of test cases. Fascinating but, question though. It's yeah, nice. it's a very interesting question. Very interesting question. Yeah. Um, okay, should we talk about uh, Nisa? We're, should we talk about the wine, Nisa? Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. So I'm not sure. I'm sure we have various different vintages. You guys should uh, speak up on the chat room about what vintage you guys might be drinking of Nisa. I have the 17 open, Ew. which I opened about an hour ago. Somebody's asking about stem choice. Uh, these are just standard uh, kind of like well, almost Bordeaux, just straight up uh, uh, larger, larger Bordeaux kind of stems. I'm, I, I, I'm not a big fan of the the Riedel Pinot glasses in particular, um, nothing against Riedel. I am a big fan of wine glasses. I mean, drinking wine out of plastic or drinking wines out of the little tiny ones or whatever always makes me nuts. But when it comes to- Mason jars? I'm sorry? Mason jars, come on. That's yeah, yeah. I, don't, I, yeah, I don't know, Mason jars, not my thing. But um, for me, it's, it's more about having consistency. And I, I find that if I'm drinking, I drink, I, believe it or not, I drink more than just Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Um, but having the same uh, glasses and sort of drinking different wines, I just like to have the consistency of glass. It's just something that I'm used to and so forth. But it's really down to personal preference. Um, I think that the, um, there, there's obviously a lot of effort gone into in the last 20, 30 years is a lot, such better glassware available. Um, Tracy, if you, you have a bigger opening, right? If you have a bigger bowl and a bigger opening, you're going to notice a difference. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Evidently. I don't like the small, I mean, real makes those Syrah, they're sort of taller ones, but they're Syrah and they have a close, uh, the, the, the opening is much smaller. I really don't like those at all for Pinot. I like to have a, a, a big opening, but it doesn't need to necessarily be the bulbous, whole thing where it's fatter at the bottom and then and sort of goes up, at least in my opinion. But I mean, everybody's got their own. Um, I'm drinking 17. What are you drinking, Tracy? I'm drinking 17. Okay. <laughs> you should have pulled, I guess one of us should have pulled out something older. I haven't tried the 17s very much since we bottled them. Um, it's, it's just such an amazing vintage to have such resolved tannins this early, but still feel that sort of dustiness that, at least in my mind, tells me that this wine's going to age so beautifully. So often the wines at this stage, because of the way we make wines, you know, we're really following that Mayo Camazé um, winemaking canvas, right? We're really working on tannins and ageability that they can be a little bit chunky and blocky at this stage. And you, you can feel like, wow, this is a beautiful wine. I'm really excited to see where it's going to go. 17 is that amazing combination of, I can't wait to see where this is going to go, but man, it's really good right now, which is fun. To, I mean, it's just a vintage hit, right? It's the way the vintage came together. A warm year with a lot of fruit um, to create some softness and the aromatics on the 17 are beautiful. And the finish is really, for a, for a young wine, it has this finish that just keeps going and is, is a lot of complexity and um, really lovely. 
really soft too. I mean, the tannins are there. You definitely know, as you say, this wine's going to last. Um, got really nice viscosity. It's not certainly not lacking. It's not. I mean, I suppose in some ways it's lighter than 16. Um, people might say the word lighter, but lighter, I, I don't think it's lacking in, 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 it's not less substantial, I suppose, is, is, is the way I would put it. I mean, this one is- flavor really, intensity. It's just, there's no heaviness to it. When you say yeah. light, I think that's right because the heaviness is gone, but the intensity of the wine is really present. There's a question about oak um, on the wines and how much oak we put in the wines, French, new. We, um, for the Willamette Valley, we're always around 30 to 35% new oak. Um, and the single vineyards and the own rooted around 50%. Um, that's the target. That's what we really think these wines can carry. And we're lucky. So we're working with almost predominantly Francois Frere. Um, but they're not the Francois Frere that you often see in the U.S. It's the Francois Frere that Jean-Nicolas has worked with the, the Francois family um, in Savigny Le Bon to create barrels that are of a lighter toast and a lighter footprint fingerprint on the wine. So for us, it's about creating texture. Again, it's a breathable vessel. That is the number one most important thing of a new oak barrel. Um, but they're also insanely expensive. So you want some kind of impact, right? But that impact should be textural and it should be, again, thinking of it as seasoning your food, a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper, something that's going to create more aromatics and flavor and texture in the wine that's already there not something that's going to layer on top of it and sort of start to shut it down. So that's always the goal for us. And we found 50% is what allows us to do that, especially as the wines age. More than that kind of takes over. Yeah, and it, I think that we've all had wines that the oak was more dominant than anything else. And uh, some people like that. And it's, a, it's sort of a stylistic thing, but it's certainly not wines that, that we're interested in making. And I think that it's interesting that after those couple of years and, you know, jean Nicolas and I, we tasted all these wines and all these different vineyards and come up, jean Nicolas says, I think we want to do about 30% new oak with the Willamette Valley. And um, we haven't deviated from it. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, we've tried different things, but he got it right, right out of the box. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, 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 the right amount of that, of that oak to add that element. I, I'm a little worried about the barrels for this year. I mean, we were talking about that, uh, you know, getting shipments from France. jean Nicolas is, is obviously very close with the Francois Frere, and, and he, he puts his order in for Mayo Camise and, and Nicolas J at the same time. We, we get them, but they're not open right now. Uh, they're not making any barrels right now. And uh, it's going to be really interesting to see. It's, it's uh, the idea that we could potentially have a vintage with, without any new barrels because you can't physically get them. I mean, it's something you have, to, you have to really be thinking about. I mean, it's one of many, many, many things that uh, has been upended and things that you have to, we have to think about in terms of adjusting for this, uh, this horrible pandemic that we're going through. But we plow ahead, and I hope uh, we talked about this last week. But I hope everybody on the on this webinar, no one has any health issues or any friends or family that have it. It's it's just been trying not to watch the news uh, too much, but you know enough to know what's going on. But it does appear that it's the deaths are still going up in New York, where you know, I have many, 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 many friends, uh, both in, in in the wine business and restaurants, but as well. Uh, you know, just friends over the years in music. And um, it's it's just been terrible, terrible there. And New Orleans now getting hung in there. So hopefully uh, we're working through it. Um, so there's a lot of really encouraging things going on as well that'll hopefully get us in a position where we can all be doing this in person soon. So anyways, back to the NISA. Uh, we just released this wine. Those of you that are in the conferee uh, on, this, on this webinar uh, just got those wines and hopefully are drinking the 17 right now. Um, but uh, we do have a little bit left of this, I believe. Most of it went to the conferee and there's a little bit that we had for our restaurant and retail partners. But um, I do believe Jonathan has just a little bit of that left at this point. Um, let's see. There's a question here about why am I not wearing a Go-Go's t-shirt? Well, uh, last week I wore the, the, the Run DMC t-shirt for jean Nicolas benefit. And I did have a something corporate t-shirt on earlier, um, but I don't know. I was going to be on with Tracy. I wanted to put on a nice shirt. I mean, you know, I, I don't know. I asked Tracy if, I, if there was a particular t-shirt that drove her, uh, that made her batty, because so, a little bit of controversy in the call. But um, 
I do have a music thing. I don't know if any of you guys uh, ever watch Colbert, but um, if you saw Michael Stipe perform on Monday night, he did this, uh, it's the first time I've heard Michael perform a song on his own, possibly ever, actually. I'm trying to think about it. Actually, it was just him with a backing track and he had it set up, uh, I don't know where it physically was. I haven't actually reached out to him since, he, since I saw it. But it was a new song that he performed that was really good and, and very poignant for what's going on, as you, as you could imagine. But if you uh, search for it on Colbert, I'm sure you can check it out. But uh, it's interesting what's going on with musicians having to adapt. I saw Alicia Keys do something like that um, the other day. But people are now having performing, and they're performing just them. And it's really interesting what artists are able to rise to that occasion and create an opportunity with a, a backing track and their, the way their personality works, if they're able to actually pull that off. Um, but it's certainly, you know, obviously very different right now in terms of uh, what's going on. It's actually really interesting, I think. And for us in the wine business, um, to even doing this tasting tonight and, and, and what we're trying to put together, and as I mentioned, we're working a lot with different people about coming up with different ideas that are educational, some things with food and so forth. But there's a lot of reinvention going on. Um, obviously, none of this matters as much as health. But, but given the fact that we do have our health, um, we're trying to figure out what to do with business. And uh, it's, it's been really, in a ways, it's, it's, it's kind of wakes everybody up. And you, you have to kind of really get creative and really use the, maybe a part of your brain that you were not necessarily using as much as, as, as you should have. But anyways, back to Michael Stipe. Hopefully you guys saw that and, uh, and there'll, there'll be some, um, some interesting things will come. Maybe he'll make a record. Who knows? Tracy, you were saying something? No, I said certainly a challenge, but I've been listening to you, but also thinking while you're talking a little bit about um, why we're choosing to highlight Unrooted. Now, I got cut out when you gave the history of Oregon, so maybe you talked a little bit about this, but I think it's a really interesting question, and I feel a lot of weight working with Unrooted Vines, because if you think about it, all of Europe was Unrooted, right? California was unrooted. All these places in the world were unrooted vines. That's how people learned to make wine. That's how people fell in love with wine. That was the history of wine and it was completely destroyed, right? And it's not the same as what's happening today, but there's, a, there's a, an intensity for me that, that hits home of our way of life has changed a lot too, right? And that's what happened for these vintners. Like everything changed. And so we have the honor of working with three sites that are still showcasing what it used to be to make wine back in the day, what those, what those wines were, right? What that purity from the soil straight up through the root system into the vine and into the fruit was. Um, there's a lot of debate as to, again, whether it's better or not. What you see when you research and you read a lot of winemakers' perspectives is that there's a textural component that's really different about Unrooted. Uh, there's a softness, there's a resolution that potentially wines used to have across the world that were own rooted. And on rootstock, we see a little bit more um, sandiness, a little bit more sort of um, blockiness from the tannins and an aggressive texture that we didn't used to have. Um, so I don't know necessarily what the point is of that, but just that it feels like a real honor to be able to showcase these things. And it's three of our favorite sites. Two of them are single vineyards out of three single vineyards we make, right? And one is a blend that I think we're continually blown away by. So it's just really neat to be able to share it. And you know, for you guys to be able to try and find that when you go to the restaurants and to be able to see other people who are doing that. There's small pockets of it around the world still. And it's just fun to play with. Custodians we are and, and very lucky to be. Very That's lucky right. to be. Um, anything else that uh, we want to talk about in terms of uh, we're, we talked last time about our new our new facility. Where uh, Tracy was uh, was there today. We were doing some FaceTiming, and they poured a bunch of cement today. Um, mm -hmm. Some exciting stuff. The crush pad. The posts went in to build the our crush pad, where the the grapes will come in this fall. So things are moving along there, which is really really exciting. Let's see a little and, video of that. Yeah, you could. Can you up? Can you sh screen share that? Let's I have to see. watch it on my phone. Oh, there we go. That's right. You've got it. That. All right. This is action in, in real yeah, time. I don't know about they were necessarily uh, displaying social distancing today out there at uh, at, at, at the Nicholas J Estate, but yes. um, no, it's you know, it was one day. That. 
one day of cement pouring. Um, no, very exciting stuff. Um, if 75 you guys, today. Come again? 75 today in Oregon. We just got a blue skies in Oregon question mark. It happens every once in a while, Eric. It's one of those things. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Don't move here. Um, I think that's about all that we had. Um, I do have one thing I wanted to share with you guys. I, I get asked a lot about, you know, uh, traveling around and all the places that we go as we're, as we're uh, you know, pitching our wine and tasting with wine and doing things. Um, I was in Chicago. I mentioned this earlier on this last trip, the sort of final trip before the, before the lockdown, and um, had got turned on to this gallery um, in Chicago. Uh, and there's a slide here that hopefully is going to come up. Um, it's called Corbett, Corbett Dempsey. And uh, if you guys are, get to go to Chicago again, which I think you, you, you will, you might want to check this out. It's, it's run by these two guys, funny enough, named Corbett and Dempsey. Um, but you'll see this poster that I took a photo of, which I thought the artwork that was amazing, a, a student of, uh, of concert uh, uh, posters. But they have a series of shows that they do at this gallery. And they've been doing this for many, many, many years. The, the photos, the, the paintings you see there are from a, a, an artist that they have an ex exhibition going who I thought was quite, quite good. But more interesting to me was the fact that they have a culture of mixing music and art. And... Uh, I did get an email from them earlier this week. Uh, it's over, so you can't, it's, it's too late, we missed it. But they did have a sort of virtual uh, gallery exhibition with a musician performing, I think it was on Sunday night of this past week. But um, it, it's an amazing place. And if you're in Chicago, uh, you should definitely check it out. Um, and we also have, there's also a pizza place that both Tracy and I have been to. Tracy, do you wanna tell them about, uh, about Zach's, uh, uh, his uh, pizza place? Yeah, it's called Pizzeria Bebu, B-E-B-U. Um, and our, I think Randall's here on this chat. But um, the last time I was working the market there, I got the pleasure of going and sharing the wines with Zach and having outside of, I have to say this, because he might be on the call, my husband's uh, homemade pizza in our wood-fired oven that he built by hand. Uh, it was hands down the best pizza I've ever had super casual like great environment you can sit and have a beer or you could open a grand cru and just eat he's got a great wine list now i'm not saying that just because he has nicholas J in the pizza place but but um no it's really some very killer wines and it's sort of a hangout for for wine people in chicago so at any rate if you guys are traveling you happen to be in chicago uh you know uh, swing by the the, the gallery and, and then go get some pizza and wine or vice versa if they if they got something going on and, and, and some music going on so uh just a little bit of something to share so i hope you guys enjoy the rest of your uh, nisa and your own rooted and uh, those of you that didn't didn't have any um or you know signed up too late or whatever uh, jonathan will be sure to to make some available to you um i think he's got something coming out to you we're going to try to really um provide some bundles after these tastings uh you know with some discounted stuff and stuff that's not available i think many of you bought some of our unreleased Chardonnay uh, uh, after the last tasting. Um, we're gonna have a Chardonnay tasting coming up uh, not too, too long from now. I think it's a week from Saturday is the Chardonnay tasting. And then uh, the Saturday after that, we're doing uh, a tasting of older wines. And if you guys have ideas of subjects or things that you would like to do and have us do, um, please let us know. We're working on this all the time. And as I mentioned, we're, we're gonna put together some, uh, some pretty interesting things coming up. So I don't really have much else. Tracy, anything else to add? We did yeah. keep it under the, the, the desired hour. I know, there's a couple questions, but I don't know if we wanna delve into all that stuff. David was asking when we pull the vines out, do we do anything to the soil to try to kill the phylloxera? You know, often when you pull out vines, you let the soil rest no matter what. Um, you know, give it a chance to recoup for a year, get some compost in, really till it in well. But because you would, most people, 99% of people or more are gonna replant with rootstock, right? That's resistant to phylloxera. You don't have to worry about getting the phylloxera out because it's not gonna impact your next vines. If you have grafted rootstock, phylloxera is basically, it, it doesn't matter. It's like having mosquitoes in your vineyard. It's not really an impact. So that's kind of the response to that. But you always wanna let the soil rest if you're gonna pull vines out. 
yep. for the garden, right? Well, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are a, a family-run startup, as it were, uh, quite literally and figuratively, and your support means a ton to us, especially at this time. And we're very, very grateful, very grateful for your participation. And we're grateful for your spreading the word. Most of the people that, that end up calling us or writing us uh, have been turned on to our wine by one of you or somebody like you that, that spreads the word. And uh, there's no better, more credible source than a f one friend saying to another, hey, you got to check this wine out. And uh, we're grateful all to, to all of you for... Uh, for, for doing that for us. And we hope you stay healthy and we hope to see you a week from Saturday. And uh, thanks for tuning in. Yeah, thanks you guys. We miss interacting with everybody. It's been the weirdest part of this whole thing. So it's fun to get out, out there and talk about the wines and drink together, even virtually. <laughs> yeah. Take care, Take care. everybody.